Welcome to the Calm Heart Collective. Hello everybody and welcome back to Robot Combat tonight, episode 15 here at the Combat Collective, bringing everything you want to know from the world of Robot Combat, from the heavyweight class to the fleaweight class, from BattleBots to the live circuit, and it is finally, finally BattleBots champion season here during this very spooky October. We've waited patiently since the end of May to finally get more BattleBots Robot Combat in our hearts and souls, and boy... I think it was worth the anticipation with such an electric first episode. And honestly, with such an electric month we've had, which we're going to be discussing all about. We are talking about four heavyweight robot combat events on this special RCT episode. In fact, I may as well go over a little bit of a lay of the land of what we're talking about here on RCT over the next few weeks. Of course, robot combat tonight. Usually we try to do at least one episode a month. Maybe one every other week, if possible, if the news is there and I can get some guest hosts on. But for BattleBots and BattleBots champions, we do the show weekly. Was hoping to have some guest hosts on, but we, uh, originally we were going to record Saturday. We ended up recording Sunday instead, which is a lot harder to get my goons on because of the football season. So here we are, Sunday morning, actually. I guess it's Robot Combat in the morning, at least for our live recording here. But we are here, and we're going to be talking about BattleBots champions for the next six weeks. This week, we're also going to be discussing the other heavyweight live events that have been happening around the world, talking about competitions like Battle of Robots and Robots Live. Next week, we are going to do our big Proving Grounds catch-up to go alongside Champions Episode 2. Going to be talking about all the September and October Champions showdowns. From Fireball versus Twins to Conquering Clown versus Warthog, I look forward to that. And then the week after that, we're going to be talking about NHRL's final bot down to coincide with Champions Episode 3. And then the week after that, we're going to do more live event updates, such as Robo Riot, such as Robots Live, to go along with Champions Episode 4. And from that, we're just going to work on forward. But that's sort of the itinerary to expect over the next four weeks. But yes, like I mentioned, this episode specifically, we are talking about... Robots Live Crawley, Battle of Robots Qualifier Group A, Extreme Robots Colchester, and of course, the heart of the episode, big news, shout out to Shredder, bro, BattleBots Champions Episode 1, the premier tournament, the first qualifier tournament, and uh, shit, speaking of Shredder, bro, you know, we might as well jump into it now, we got a lot to talk about in this potentially lengthy RCT episode, we'll see what the final number comes out as. But yes, this is Robot Combat Tonight, presented by the Combat Collective, who is sponsored by a friend of Shredder Bro, RobotsRuinMyLife.com, and we're announcing our final giveaway here today. Robots Ruin My Life is a proud sponsor, proud supporter of the Combat Collective for this entire 2022 BattleBots World Championship 7 season. They are the merchandise provider for numerous Robot Combat teams, such as our best engineered robots, Ripperoni, such as our beloved robot Starchild, who we're going to be seeing in a few episodes, and such as Shredda Bro, the robot, the star of the episode here. Super happy for Evanarius and all of them. We'll talk about them a lot later in the episode. But yes, Ripperoni, Shredda Bro, and Starchild merchandise. You can find all that on robotsroommylife.com. Pick up a Ripperoni pizza box, Starchild poker chips, a Shredda Bro t shirt, and much, much more. NHRL Finals is coming up. Pick up merchandise for your favorite. Favorite NHRL finalists on robotsroommylife.com. They have Omega Team merchandise there. They have Team Shredded merchandise there. They even have some of your more fun robots like Milk Tank. They have merchandise on robotsroommylife.com. You want to shout out NHRL itself? They have NHRL merchandise you can only usually buy at the House of Havoc or NHRL.io. They also have... Robots Room My Life lifestyle merchandise, such as the tote bag we gave away a few months back, the t-shirt we gave away a few months back, alongside many other things. And if you want to get your hands on some Robots Room My Life merchandise for free, well, here it is, people. Our final giveaway we are doing this year. I am so excited about it. It is a Star Child-centric giveaway, since we do know Star Child is going to be coming up here very soon on the BattleBots Champions Qualifier Tournaments. I'm super stoked for that. You want to hop into this final giveaway? It's going to feature a Star Child t-shirt, a Star Child poker ship, and the usual batch of TCC and Robots Room My Life stickers. You get that Pori's Love Bloodsport sticker. You get the TCC sticker. You get the R. ML stickers that we've been passing through to all of them. You can get all of that 
If you sign up for the giveaway, it's going to be where it always is on Gleam.io. It's been an awesome giveaway provider for us so far. We've done some great things. Five giveaways so far, I want to say. Um, I do want to say one thing, though, about this giveaway. It is going to be United States only. Maybe North America only. Yeah, let's do North America only. It is going to be North America only. I uh, I made the mistake of having the last few giveaways be international, and then my last two winners were um, from England. Shipping is not fun to pay. I learned that the hard way. I just barely got one of our giveaway prizes out, and there's another one still in limbo just because I straight up have not been able to afford it. But, uh, so this uh, giveaway is going to be USA only. We are going to announce the giveaway winner at the end of BattleBots Champions. So you have quite some time to sign up for it. A whole month pretty much. Link is going to be in the description below. Happy entry. Hopefully you get it. We'll see you down the road. You want Star Child merchandise from Robots to Ruin My Life? Our proud partner. Sign up. But now, here we go, guys. You saw our social media post a few weeks back. There was a lot of heavyweight action over the past few weeks in the world of robot combat i love it so now let's get to these big time trio of september heavyweight showdowns before we talk about battle bots champions all across europe last month we saw big time and small time heavyweight competitors strut their stuff mid-month for prizes glory and a good spot in the tcc rankings list in russia at battle of robots we saw vapor and wayside 23 at Extreme Robots, it was the usual cast of Eruption, Zeitgel, among others. But first things first, we got to bring things a little bit full circle with the very first event we covered in rundown fashion on TCC two full years ago, Robots Live Crawley. This September event at Crawley marked the first event of Robots Live's short three-event season. And while this UK tour lacks the powerful full combat machines like Zadkiel and Galactus, it makes up by always attracting some big names such as Behemoth and Nuts, who made their 2023 debut at this event. And unlike Extreme Robots events, Robots Live goes off the usual single elimination bracket format with heats and everything. So covering this show will be a little bit more straightforward than usual. And we'll be going over every single robot from this event in an upcoming TCC breakdown video. But here, first up, we got a few highlights and the top four to talk about. Going over some notable robots at this event. And we've already discussed Nuts, who struggled heavily due to not being in a spinner-friendly environment in its smatter of fights. But it wasn't the only robot making its 2023 debut in this group. We also have two have Def Flamingo, who seemingly has moved away from Extreme Robots action, making its first appearance since November 2022. And it did its usual stuff, held its own with good control and light beak pecking, but it was far from the best axe spot at the event. That honor instead would either fall to the returning Apocalypse and Saudi Arabia 2021 winner Switch. Apocalypse again showed a surprising amount of gusto and aggression, while Switch's big time hammer managed to land some huge strikes, robots such as Vanguard, and even to its teammate Bamoth, but it fell out in round two. And finally, I got to give a quick shout out to Thunderbird 1, the only first time we're at this event. Its design was incredibly unique, kind of like a weaponless bumper car. And while it did little to nothing in the event itself, the robot was incomplete. It's always nice to see new UK robots entering the fray, joining our TCC rankings. You got to grow the sport somehow, and that's how we like to do it. Top three time though. Third place at this event would be the former FRA UK champion Toxic 3. One of the country's most powerful flippers, but one that always, oddly enough, has avoided the extreme robot circuit. It was last seen during Robots Live 2022 tour late last year, but did not waste time getting back into the 2023 flow by taking out two Extreme Robots regulars in Iron Off 6 and Mega Mouse, moving right on forward where embarrassed nuts in a round two match via out of the arena before getting embarrassed itself versus Iron Off 8, where Toxic would abruptly break down and be left stranded on its rear end. This forced Toxic 2 into the third place playoff where the decade plus old robot still managed bronze by flipping Apocalypse out of the arena in just under two minutes. Now onto our top two here and in my opinion, as it usually is with this robot, no greater story at this competition than the one we had with Bamoth. 
When we last saw Bam Moss, it was one of two robots which failed to qualify for the main tournament at Robots Live Saudi Arabia. And after a year or nothing, I was seriously worried that maybe we had finally seen the last of the legendary Bam Moss. But fear not, Make Robotics returned with not only Switch, but the sport's oldest active robot as well. Bam Moth took full control of the first melee, then defeated its teammate Switch in the quarters, leaving it to take on a robot it had faced plenty at Saudi Arabia in Apocalypse for another Axe vs. Lifter fight in the semis, and Apocalypse got dispatched by in literal seconds by the older robot Bam Moth. And this set up a final of the perky old ace and a robot which has torn it up on the circuit at Extreme Robots this year, Iron Aw 8. And Iron Aw 8 plus Shane Lale showed that modern experience mattered in droves here. As in its first fight, Iron Aw 8 would put together one of the most prolific KOs we have seen at any event this year when Iron Aw 8 threw Yotan. Get this, we're gonna have the video right here because it's so hard to explain. Into the top of the anti Aldi arena wall, leaving Yotan hanging like an ornament on a Christmas tree for one of the most metal KOs you are going to see all year. Phenomenal stuff. From here, we saw our beloved Brit Flipper Thunder Child go out of the arena in the quarterfinals, Toxic 2 then get upset in the semifinals, and unfortunately, despite a very valiant effort by Anthony Pritchard and Bamoth, it too would get sent out of the arena by Shane Lael, leaving Iron Aw 8 to finally have a proper event run under its belt this year. Iron Aw 8, our Robots Live Crawley champion, Bamoth takes a very honorable second place, Toxic 2 takes third place, and despite finishing 1 and 4, Apocalypse takes fourth place. Very bizarre. We saw something happen similar to Yotan last year. It's happening again. But there you go, Iron Aw 8 finally getting a banner event under itself after batting 500 at uh, Extreme Robots pretty much all year. More on that later, because we'll get back to the UK here in a moment. But now let's roll over to Mother Russia, where we saw the first ever major 250 pound championship in the country take place with Battle of Robots. If you followed this channel over the past month, you know that we have discussed this about as much as we can, hoping to give the event some international growth. And I gotta say, I think it lived up to the hype. It certainly was not an American presentation like we see at BattleBots, but the production value was shockingly phenomenal. The staff was energetic and filled their part. And most importantly, the robots were fantastic with veterans showing up and showing out and even more rookies with new heavyweights making their stamp on the sport for the very first time ever. We had solid flippers, we had strong spinners, international powerhouses, it truly lived up to the major event billing, but there was one big concern. There's been a ton of safety Nazis on the online community talking about the arena, even though, all things considered, I would say it did its job. Nothing exited the perimeters of the box like we saw at Robo Games. There were two eyebrow-raising moments, though, I gotta admit. One where a small piece of a robot got lodged into the ceiling, and one where Daddy's bot, an insane drum bot partaking in Group Bay, completely ripped apart a segment of the arena bumper wall. This was during a demo fight, but all things considered, in my opinion, the fight should have been stopped with a weapon that insane inside the box and what was pretty much just exposed Lexan potential getting hit. Very scary stuff. There's a month, though, between the September and October events, and I hope we can see Battle of Robots learn from the few things that went wrong during this event and improve it, because I really, really do believe that these guys are onto something special with the fight quality we saw, the field we saw, but that is the elephant in the room out of the way. We're going to go over all 24 robots at this event in a separate breakdown video, but here let's go over some favorites of mine from each round, and most importantly, our six machines qualified for the November semifinals. Now, there were still a handful of fodder robots in round one, from brand new teams to veterans who have not evolved from the 2019 era, but there were also definitely some I really wish we could have seen fight more than once. Unfortunately, there were no whiteboard fights at this show outside of the two demo battles they did with Daddy's Bot. And honestly, I think our biggest round one dropout here has to be Gene the Crocodile. This robot gathered interest very quickly after being shown thanks to its gnome-themed team and its solid Blood Moon-style design. Sadly though, in its only fight versus Hypericum, a solid weapon was just not enough 
as its sluggish drive hurt it massively, left it to be striked from all angles by Hypericum. That, though, wasn't the case for the very sleek Tomb clone known as Number 17. This robot absolutely looked the part, looked like a Battlebots machine. It moved quickly, but its weapon blade was made out of straight up Chinesium, as one impact against Sarkel was enough to split that weapon in two, leaving number 17 a hot mess for the rest of its very entertaining fight, smoldering in defeat. But now, onto the round two dropouts, and honestly, in my opinion, the real story here is what happened to the nation of India, who was arguably the most experienced nation present of the four at this qualifier, despite only being there with two robots in the house, with Team Prix's Sarkel and Team Panther's War Machine. Both War Machine and Sarkel dominated Volge in number 17, but then fell in shocking, violent fashion to a pair of breakout Russian robots in Adam and Wayside 23, respectively. More on them later, though. Round 2 also saw the 1-1 one -one rookies of Master of Fields and Hypericum fall out in judges' decisions. Both robots had promising weapons, which can improve dramatically, I think. Watch out for them in the future. Hypericum had that solid Mo style weapon, and Master of Fields, a pretty solid drum bot. Looks like it has a good defensive system as well. But finally, our six qualifiers we are going to be seeing again in November. Vamber, of course, made it through fairly easily, and so did the new Ronin esque robot Redhorn, who ended up being the only robot to pull off two knockouts on the entire show, making it the highest ranked TCC robot. We'll talk more about that next week. Honey Badger also showed the Bite Force style design is always a winner by putting parts of other robots into the ceiling. And Lonely Wolf, friend of the Combot Collective, became the first international qualifier into the semis after suffering issues early on in the qualifiers, but then turning it around in the very end. Finally, though, I got a highlight. I already mentioned him once. Adam and Wayside 23. Adam in its battle versus Top Seed Sarkel was a thrilling back and forth drum battle and a big time comeback win for it, showing that the team still might have another championship run in their hands. And the Cobalt esque Wayside 23 managed to roof War Machine multiple times in the show's final fight. A true star making performance for the Cobalt style robot. It looks the part, has a weapon that operates the part. You can see it right here. This robot is absolutely insane. I absolutely love it. I know some people were like, oh, we have Cobalt at home. No, this is Cobalt in Russia. It's absolutely phenomenal. It looked great. So that means Weber, Redhorn, Wayside 23, Adam, Honey Badger, and Lonely Wolf all qualified for the September semifinals, which are going to be happening in November. If you want to see this event, though, the B qualifier, which is going to be featuring a lot more robots, 36 in total, I believe, some from China, some from India. We're finally going to get to see China back into the heavyweight scene. I believe it's going to be happening on the 21st of October, 3 a.m. Central Time. I know I'm setting my alarm for it. I am absolutely stoked. But finally, it is back to jolly old England, the UK. The Extreme Robots midseason break is over, and we are now back in the thick of things with numerous new robots hopping into the XR 2023 season for half number two, and even more to come in October with Toughest Nails making its first appearance since the pandemic and Monsoon making its first appearance since Battleboss 2022. Here, though, at Colchester in September, it wasn't the team's focus. Instead, everyone was hustling towards championship titles and team points, with Tectonic, Zagkiel, and Team Quake all desperately holding on to their respective thrones. Now, this was a very interesting event, because compared to all of our other Extreme Robots events we've seen this year, we had little to no free agents at all during the entirety of the weekend. I believe the only one robot that was not assigned to any specific team was Thunderchild, from our dear friends at Team Ironclads, and I may even be incorrect about that. Hopefully, I can hear from Joseph, Prophet, and the rest of the team soonish enough. Still very cool to see little no free agents. Everyone having a spot, everyone having their position to help one of these four big teams out. Now, though, let's briefly discuss these four teams, and I'm going to keep saying it. If you want the full scoop on these robots and fights, stay tuned for our preview video later in the month, hopefully before the 21st I can get it out since that's the next Extreme Robots event. Let's start it off, though, with the struggling Team Divinity, who honestly may be the story of this September 16th weekend. The team has not won a show at Extreme Robots since the inaugural weekend of the team format last year. They've been bottom feeders since... 
but they managed to pull it all together here and finally win a stop, win the Sunday show. I was so excited. Gabriel managed its second win in as many events. The Saint, our bottom ranked robot on the TCC rankings, managed to break a 10 plus fight losing streak with a shock knockout W to end the streak. And Ripper number six even managed to have a bounce back weekend by winning all three of its battles by just a decision. The real star, though, was, of course, Zai Kiel, who entered the weekend preparing for two spinners' titles defenses and successfully won both, moving itself into the number two position on our TCC overall rankings. More on that next week, though, when we do another full coverage of the rankings in total. We've had a lot of top 10 shifts moving around, and we're probably going to have even more with the Battle Boss Champions tournament going down. Now on to Team Quake, our standing leaders entering this event. They meanwhile just sort of stood down pat while a lot of other teams made the significant moves. Only two major changes on this group. The usual roster of Manta, Tectonic, Troublemaker, and even Thor were present, but the buzz was all on Aftershock finally getting two replacements to cover it, Oakland A style here. Replacing Aftershock from the Team Shock side of things would be the team's brand new Flipper Poseidon, a refurbished and repainted robot once named Ace, while replacing Aftershock on the full combat side of things will be none other than Donald Thump, who had finally found a home here with Team Quake. All the shifts, though, I guess, ended up making this a shaky event, all things considered. The team ended up leaving with zero points on the weekend, and they lost their lead after numerous issues. Maybe not as many issues, though, as one Team Wolfpack. Team Wolfpack's weekend was also built all around the arrival of new robots with Shane Lale's new front hinge flipper called the Alpha, who was replacing the recently traded TR4. TR4 didn't have the greatest events with their debut on Team Divinity, but its replacement unfortunately managed to fare even worse. The Alpha's flipper dealt with faulty wiring the entire weekend and could not self-write. In fact, shit, it could barely even flip. It lost its debut Fight Club Melee in only seconds and then did similar on its two livestream fights during show number two and number three. Nobody else here really impressed either though. The Iron Awe Trio went a collective two and seven and Mega Mouse became the sole highlight for Team Wolfpack when the Extreme Robots title before losing it five hours later to the same robot later that day. And now, finally, it took them a while, but it looks like the more things change, the more they stay the same at Extreme Robots. This time last year, Team Inferno had long sealed itself as the annual Extreme Robots team champion. This year, they've only just now taken the lead after winning the first two of three events on the Colchester weekend. Unlike all these other, much larger teams, the Team Inferno crew stuck to the same four robots they've had all year, and apparently that was all they needed. Collectively, the Quadrant of Ignition, Implosion, Beast, and a top 10 ranked Eruption would go 11-6 and six on the weekend. Very impressive as now they just got to hold the lead for two more stops, six more shows. And if they do that, they will leave with the Extreme Robots team title and the cash prize for a second straight year. Going to be very interesting to see what all goes down in this final two event stretch. Which team will Tough as Nails and Monsoon join? Can Team Divinity win six straight events to tie for first? Only time will tell. I'm very eager to see what happens on the 21st when Extreme Robots continues on. But y'all, let's now get into what we've all been waiting to discuss here for quite a few months on the Combat Collective. We've talked about the live events. We've talked about the live streamed events. Let's hop onto national TV. Let's hop into the big streaming service. It's time for the return of BattleBots Champions, the quest for the Golden Bolt. On our last RCT, we went over the details, the minimum we knew about the big champions bracket, and we even talked about some confirmed fights, one of which we got to see here in this episode with Rotator vs. Teratops. And uh, honestly, what a first episode this was. It talked about a little bit at the very, very start of this RCT, but man, this really was the perfect way to kick off another championship journey. Gotta give credit to BattleBots, it's kind of ballsy to assemble a premiere episode for a series and then have it not feature any massive stars like Witch Doctor, Minotaur, or even Saw, Blaze, and Huge, but they put together really, honestly, something special here. The big names we did have, such as Rotator and Scorpius, were present, but shockingly enough, they really weren't the story of the show here. Nope. 
This first Insegi Slugfest was a story of underdogs. And speaking of Scorpius, no better way than to start with the first match of the episode here to really build this underdog story on Robot Combat tonight. It was Scorpius, 4-3, and three, number 45 on the TCC rankings at this point, taking on Shredded, 2-2, two and two, number 69, nice, on the TCC rankings. And Scorpius entered this tournament as the people's favorite, all things considered, but far from the raw favorite itself. Sure, it made the playoffs, but that was during a run where it was mired by internal issues and questionable decisions by the team inside and outside the ball box. We've had fans and even commentators alike be frustrated by its over-aggressive driving and choices such as running the overkill blade in the much-anticipated Saw Blaze fight. But Scorpius could have a chance to right all those wrongs in a rematch with Saw Blaze, but first, it had to survive here. Shredder Bro, meanwhile, was playing with house money on the line. It has not been a good year for Team Shredded. The three-pound version has fumbled the ball massively this year, and the 250-pound version has followed suit. After two years of frustration with Pain Train, the Shredded design was brought up to 250 pounds with serious expectation but very little delivery. A majority of its fights were riddled with internal issues, and some even ended up being used as filler pieces. Despite its 2-2 two and two record, it was never really considered for the playoffs. And because of that, it was clear to everyone in the sport that if Team Shredded underperformed here, they likely wouldn't be near the ball box for a very, very long time. Let's talk about modifications, though, before we jump into the fight. Shredded entered this battle with UHMW sides attached to its drum motors, added for, I guess, some protection, maybe some weight loss. I'm not fully sure what the move was there. We saw it quite a bit, though, this episode. While Scorpius entered very traditionally, signature plow, signature hammer saw. It is the Scorpius we all knew and love. And that's probably because the Scorpius team was very confident in this fight, given the pre-fight interview. They taught... Zach and Diana talked about how with Shredded's past struggles in its small boxy shape, they felt like they could right get in there and, you know, just strike that flat top and do some genuine damage. And I was on board. Confidence, though, dwindled quickly. Shredded looked a lot like more the robot we saw versus Overhaul than the robot we saw versus Horizon. Their 60-pound drum would not relent at all during this fight, and this honestly became the story of the tournament. Things really just went from bad to worse here for Scorpius. Smoke came out of the weapon arm just seconds into the fight, and the weapon chain didn't even make it past the first minute versus Shredded Bro. Scorpius would go 0-2 on hammersaw strike attempts while Shred delivered the largest hits in his 250-pound career, looking much like it did during his 2021 NHRL form. And all this led to a huge upset victory. Shredded Bro won by knockout here in 2 minutes and 7 seconds. Easily the largest win in the team's heavyweight history and one of the biggest upsets we've seen out of Battle Boss Champions, aka Bounty Hunters. Any sort of bracket, shoot, you can conclude Desperados in that. Any eight robot bracket, this is one of the biggest upsets I think we have ever seen. And quick note here, I do like the Kenny Florian's keys to win. I think that's a really fun thing to add. The betting odds are neat, but I do think it is super bizarre to put up betting odds for a fight that happened over a year ago. I mean, you guys know something we don't about this fight. What are y'all doing putting these betting odds up while you're literally editing the event? I don't know. I think it's a good idea. I think it makes it more sports-like. I really would like to see BattleBots incorporate more of a sports book inter integration into um, BattleBots as a whole. I was talking about that on the BattleBots Wiki Discord just yesterday, in fact. I think it will be really cool to see an in-house sports book at BattleBots during uh, Proving Grounds, during the recordings themselves, you know. Just the way, to, you know, between fights, before the taping itself, go over there and bet on the main event, bet on the opener, bet on random fights, make a little bit of money. I know I would certainly do that if I was at a recording. I feel like I'd be pretty good at it. But I digress. Moving on to our second fight here, Teratops. Number 14, thanks to its big Roma Games run, sitting at 4-2, and two, taking on Rotator, 2-3 and three with a low number. 80 ranking as with this second round one match we jumped right into the pit of alternates very early this time around as captain by ben burton we have teratops who has been easily the most impressive alternate battle bots has ever invited in my opinion making fans quickly think that this robot should have been in the main field instead this robot proved its worst even more so with a wicked run at robo games where it eviscerated machines such as lazy bot and route to a top eight finish but this tournament technically happened before Robo Games, well before, in fact. 
Will Teratops hold up with only two fights experience at this point? It would need to do so versus a top tier undercutter like Rotator. Victor Soto's Surgeon General esque robot has been a perennial championship favorite, but in 2022, like Chris Rose put it, the robot was honestly never at 100% despite advancing to the round of 32. We saw it struggle versus robots like Jackpot and Hydra, and then in the playoffs had just an okay defeat against Copperhead. Robots are always known to perform much better in the Golden Bolt bracket, and Team Revolution certainly hope for that here. Though anything, honestly, would be a better showing compared to what happened to them last time at Battle Watch Champions vs. Glitch. Talking about modifications now, though, Teratops entered this fight with its Tricera Vert alongside two very odd Tegris blockers on the lifting arms, acting as a little bit of an anti-rotator, anti-horizontal spinner defense. More on them later. Rotator, meanwhile, goes undercutter. Rocking the wheel guards with three wedge forks in the rear for defense. A very traditional look for Rotator, all things considered. The Teratops team was very anxious about this Rotator matchup. Ben Burton even cited that this was one of the three robots he least wished to fight against at this competition. And you can tell the team was a little bit flustered by this matchup. Teratops tried to play off offense at first, raising the lifter up and playing aggressor. But just after three strikes from Rotator across the opening 20 seconds, we had Teratops fighting the rest of this fight with only one side of drive. Teratops then dropped his lifter back down and tried moving towards a bit of more of a defensive driving style. But fantastic driving and aggression by Victor Soto took the rookie all over the battle box, upside down, right side up really making use of the upper deck at various points of the fight as well. And then in the final minute of the fight, Teratops was dragged over to the corner corrals of the arena. And after a valiant and offensive performance by Teratops and Ben Burton, ultimately it was all for naught. This one-sided battle ended with Rotator taking the knockout. At I have wicked high hopes for its 2024 campaign. I still firmly believe that it is going to be a Rookie of the Year arms race between it and Manta, and the winner will quite frankly be all of us. That being said, Kenny made a good note here, a lesson to be learned with those anti-rotator blockers that I mentioned. They only got in the way during the face-to-face -face exchanges with Rotator. Really felt like they just kind of pushed Rotator away instead of eating the strikes. Expect the Teratops team to reinforce those wedges in the future. Maybe avoid any extra attachments. It just seems like less is more in this decision. But a good lesson learned nonetheless for what is still a very inexperienced rookie team making waves already. But hey, it's time to talk about my favorite here. I got the Rangers helmet right here. I got the Rangers hat and jersey on. On to the robotic great from the Lone Star State. My beloved home region of DFW has not ever really set the world on fire in terms of robot combat heavyweights. In the Comedy Central era, we had Gort and Billy Bot, both of which struggled, never made TV. In Robo Games era, we had Cavalier from UT Arlington, and as cool as it was, it really didn't do so hot in action. Switchback has flipped all that on its head. After a very experimental 2021, Switchback was rebuilt as a killer for 2022 with a 3-2 playoff year plus an impressive weekend at Proving Grounds very recently. Uh, weekend we'll be discussing in detail next week on Robot Combat tonight. And, you know, I may be a Rangers fan, but they certainly aren't the only Texas team I was cheering for this October. All of my chips were on Switchback heading into this event, and I had no shame to admit it. DFW, baby. And, you know, to be honest, I felt pretty confident in this pick given who their first opponent was with Matt Spurks Kraken. It has been a rough couple of years for Kraken. It had a banner year in 2020 with a deep bounty run and a top 32 appearance, but it's all been murky waters for the Florida Pirates of CM Robotics since. 2021 saw Kraken be a bottom feeder in the TCC rankings after an 0-4 season. And when we all thought things would change in 2022, they simply did not. While Matt Spurk did completely rework Crack and be better at winning judges' decisions, they ended up inadvertently exchanging weapon power for reliability. Kraken again went 0-4 in the regular season and again found itself in the bottom 10 rankings for TCC, with a bottom 5 position looming closer and closer with a loss here. Let's talk about the fight. Modifications first as always. Switchback entered almost as it looked in its BattleBots photo only missing the two front lifting forks for easier offensive reach versus Kraken's weapon. And Kraken, meanwhile, all things considered, kept it traditional. Same robot we've seen all year with Wally the Narwhal on the side. Hopefully we'll actually see it do some action this time, and quite frankly, 
We did, for better or worse. Both these robots were very similar somewhat. Two compact four-wheel drive robots with vertical spinners on an articulated arm. Both teams kept strategy quite simple with both looking to just get the right strikes in the right places quickly so they could advance. But Switchback's 40-pound drum would quickly outmatch Kraken's 13-pound disc though. As within 10 seconds, Wally was rocked and Kraken was flipped over and spiked into the red square screws by Switchback, killing Kraken's weapon in just one shot. That's that Texas stuff I like to see. From here though, it was a three-minute bullying fest by Switchback, who chose to play it safe running down the clock instead of trying to be a bruiser by choosing to turn off its weapon under its own volition. No KOs here. Switchback ran the time down the same way Rotator did. A lot of rams to the screws and a lot of brutal flips on Kraken, who did all they could to persevere and fight back with all they could muster. And to its credit, unlike Teratops, Kraken did go the full three minutes, which prevented Switchback from accruing another two points in our TCC rankings. Switchback won by a unanimous judge decision. And from the Rangers sweeping the Rays to Switchback taking out Kraken, it looks like all of Dallas-Fort Worth decided to go fishing for round one, and we got some deadly, deadly catches. I'm super happy for Switchback. Obviously, spoilers here. It's a shame they didn't win round two. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but hey. I love Greg Dale and the rest of this crew making DFW proud. But now, our final fight of round one was probably the most 50-50 of the three. And that's because Valkyrie, with his new captain, Lucy Dew, had not been having the year any of us had hoped for. This new look Valkyrie and its new look questionable designs pit crew, much like Shredder Bro, wasn't necessarily horrible at 2-2. Two and two, But it was far from the playoff picture, with all of its fights being mostly unsensational. Its only notable moment of the regular season, in fact, was its overturned judge's decision against Malice, where Valkyrie somehow, some way, almost won a fight despite literally not having a weapon for most of said fight. We've seen how good Lucy Dew can be with undercutters though, such as Hot Leap Juice or more recently Kablooey Tango. We know she can drive robots like this, but the team just, quite frankly, needed to pull together some results. You know who needed results more though? Team Kodox with Ominous. Ominous was a monster on the TCC rankings in 2021. It sat at number 16 overall to end last year with three KOs at Extreme Robots. But like we mentioned during the regular season, Battle Bus is a completely different ball game. And after a 1-3 regular season, you can be the coolest design in the world. But hey, BattleBots only has so many slots for international competitors. And with machines like Zykiel, Orby Blade, and Orion so clamored for next year, some of these internationals are going to have to go. And entering this bracket, as much as I hate to say it, the, the legendary Dutch team was probably on the chopping block. Much like Team Shredded, this would be a much win for Tim Bowens and the rest of Team Kodox. Let's talk about modifications. Valkyrie ran no lance, but it did run its 2-2 Sweet Caroline Blade. Ominous, meanwhile, brought out a wicked-looking anti-horizontal spinner plow. One of the beefiest we've seen all year. This thing looked absolutely great. I don't know what's up with anti-spinner plows just making me just drool over them. But they always look so sleek. And I gotta say, I know Ominous is compact, but the sheer size between these two robots was absolutely insane. And Valkyrie really isn't one of the bigger robots in the field either. And it dwarfed Ominous, made Ominous look tiny. And I gotta say as well here, this is in my opinion, the best fight of round one. It wasn't a three minute showdown. It ended by KO. But when I was watching this fight with my stepfather, I think we both came to the conclusion that this fight truly felt like a boxing match between two actual humans. It was two relentless fires going pretty much perfectly 50-50 with one another for most of the fight, exchanging strike after strike with Ominous taking impacts just slightly better, and then BOOM! All it takes is one massive strike to end a boxing match, and that is exactly what we got here in this barn burner of a battle. Ominous kept that plow to Valkyrie's face the best it could all fight, and Valkyrie did all it could to keep against such a chonky wedge. And despite some struggle with recoil, Lucy Dew and Valkyrie did manage to rip off a layer of Ominous's plow just a minute out into the battle. And then right at the fight's 1 minute and 30 second mark, one of the rear wheels of Ominous would start shredding away, 
part of the Omni rollers, bits of yellow scattered all around the front of the drivers. But Ominous still moved forward, sparking up a perfect storm for that aforementioned monster hit that honestly had serious shades of Son of Waiachi versus Endgame. Both robots went flying directly back into their starting squares with vicious force, and sparks flew all over the arena. This was likely the largest strike of the entire episode, and we saw Valkyrie lose a large portion of its front armor, but ultimately that did not matter. Ominous was dead in the water, with only its slow lifting arm working after the wicked impact, and this meant Valkyrie was moving on with a knockout in 2 minutes and 43 seconds, and now it was big trouble in Little Holland for Ominous. I absolutely adore this robot and team, but it may take a few more big reps at events like Extreme Robots if we hope to see the Dutch team return to the battle box in the near future. Really heartbreaking. I love Petunia. I love Ominous. I love Pulverizer. I love Gravity. I love the Dutch robot contingent. But we might not see him next year. Doesn't look good. That's four fights up, four fights down. Semifinals time for qualifier number one as it was Shredder Bro. Now 3-2, and two, number 44 overall. Taking on Switchback, 5-3, and three, number 21 overall. You can kind of see it. My favorite number. That was awkward of a that was a little bit of an awkward twist there. But Shredder Bro, despite being my legit number eight out of eight pick to win this tournament, the bottom of my barrel entered this fight easily with the most momentum out of any qualifier one semifinalist. All the confidence has finally been backed up by the New York Super Team. Shredder Bro faced a gatekeeper of Balbots and Scorpius and looked stronger, more durable, and certainly more destructive with a shock knockout. My pick, though, Switchback on paper looked to be in a phenomenal place. An easy victory versus Kraken meant very few repairs needed to be done, and now it was onto a robot which has struggled with long repair times, much less the more truncated times we see with the Golden Bolt tournament. I can admit it here, this fight was the Texas robots to lose. And I guess Team Shreddit said, you know, what works shouldn't change it. They kept those UHMW sightings on the drum, while Switchback, meanwhile, did make some big changes here. They ditched the wide forks for a full anti-spinner bumper and a sturdy front beater wedge on the front for the egg beater. Looked like a solid setup for what was going to be happening with Shreddit Bro, but as we saw in a second, Jesus Christ. In his pre-fight interview, Evan Aria said that he felt more confident than ever, and that's honestly saying something. And that momentum I mentioned certainly played as an intangible here, because within seconds of the fight kicking off, Shredder Bro would do to switch back what it did to Kraken and eviscerate its weapon belt within seconds entering the fight. Not even 10 seconds in, in fact, quicker than the Kraken fight. And then only seconds after the belt busting, Switchback began smoking. A few seconds after that, Switchback then tried to retreat and Shredder Bro annihilated the back panel on the Egg Beater's armor bumper, leaving pretty much a damaged spoiler just hanging off the rear end of Switchback. And Switchback failed to relent from here. Eventually, Shredder finished off the damaged armor panel and even killed the weapon arm as it knocked out Switchback in dramatic fashion with a 6-8 to eight foot high impact that left Switchback literally saying, Bruh! After the hit, one of the most beautiful hits all episode, I gotta say. It's so cool when you see a robot die in like such a weird, awkward position. Very neat, made for great TV. As Shredder Bro wins my knockout here in one minute and 45 seconds, didn't even need the two minutes. Taking out two playoff robots back to back. That is wicked cool. But here, moving forward here on to semifinal two, it is the fight we all wanted to see when this bracket was announced. Back in the stressful year of 2020, we didn't have much, but we still had BattleBots, and BattleBots managed to deliver one hell of a fight during the season with a battle of undercutters between Rotator and Valkyrie. In what BattleBots themselves called the most slicey-dicey fight in the sport's history, we saw both robots fail to give in at all over three minutes of electric fighting as Rotator began falling apart in the final minute, awarding Valkyrie a judge's decision win in what was one of the greatest battles of all of 2020. Both of these robots have been on a back step since this iconic fight, though, and only one could really improve to the top ranks of the sport and make it to the final of this qualifier tournament. But there is one thing worth noting. That 2020 fight had Frederick Moore, now the driver of Ripperoni, behind the wheel of Valkyrie, which meant Lucy Dew would be facing Rotator for the first time ever here, while Victor Soto was well-adjusted to what Valkyrie brought to the table with what could have been a more inexperienced driver, all things considered. 
Let's jump into the fight, though. Valkyrie ran the exact same setup we saw it run in 2020 with their new Glory Blade being used, their tri-bar kind of style one. Rotator, meanwhile, kind of... Kind of the same thing, kind of not compared to 2020. They ran the sturdy anti-horizontal spinner wedge again, but this time, very uniquely enough, ran a overcutter configuration, which had the blade at a very sleek 10 degree angle downward, perfect for attacking Valkyrie's body. Gotta say, we've seen Valkyrie, I'm sorry, we've seen Rotator look just slightly different every single fight. This was probably the slickest Rotator has ever looked, in my opinion. And you know, it's hard to live up to the hype of an incredible first fight. Just look at Blacksmith versus Minotaur in 2016 compared to 2018. But this one was a sequel that most certainly equaled. And quite frankly, it went shockingly similar to what we saw all the way back in 2020. This battle was like yin and yang. Both robots were symmetric, digging into one another's exposed portions up front with Valkyrie landing the stronger hits, but Rotator eating them better, kind of like what we saw in the ominous fight. And then there were a couple of scary moments. Both robots spun out momentarily at various moments. Valkyrie almost got to the top of Rotator's wheels. Rotator took some armor off the side of Valkyrie, exposing a wheel. But both fighters held their ground until the one minute, 35 second point of the fight. Here, much like we saw with Ominous and Valkyrie, a hard collision that sent both robots flying, and again, Valkyrie came out the better with Rotator completely shredding its left tire in the collision. This left Rotator limp for the fight's remaining minute and change, still with life and still able to land some horizontal spinner impacts, but the drive was severely hindered and made it very hard for Rotator to defend, and this ended up being the catalyst of it all too. The fight went that full three minutes, and after a shocking judge's decision appeal, you really don't see Victor Soto as the guy, type of guy to appeal a judge's decision. Well, I guess that's not true. They would have appealed to beat a JD, but I digress. It was another battle where in the final minute, Rotator began to crumble while Valkyrie stayed strong, as now the Boston Undercutter sat at 2-0 on its fellow Undercutter Rotator with two different drivers behind the wheel. Lucy Dew had locked in the same way she had in the past with machines like Kablooey Tango and Hot Leaf Juice, and now she was looking pretty prime for one more fight versus fellow underdog Shreddit Bro. And here we go. You two four and two robots. Shreddit number 22, Valkyrie number 16, and honestly, you could not line it up better. Two robots from longtime NHRL teams, both of which, despite going 2-2 two and two in the regular season, had often been looked at as low-tier robots due to constant internal quarrels versus robots which were just simply better. This is the beauty of BattleBots champions, though. All these robots have been through a ruthless BattleBots season. They worked out the kinks, and now we are truly getting to see the best of every single robot competing in the Sin City Slugfest. Valkyrie is looking like Kablooey Tango, and Shredded Bro was truly giving shades of its smaller, older brother. And shockingly, talking about NHRL, neither of these teams have met inside an NHRL arena at any class in the past, despite both of these crews constantly being in attendance at those competitions. And of course, neither have met inside the battle box under any context as well. And for the last time on Champions Qualifier 1, let's talk about modifications. Shredder Bro ditched the UHMW drum sightings to go back to the blue buffers we see in their bot picture, as meanwhile Valkyrie would return to its 65-pound Sweet Caroline blade it used against Ominous, which took a little bit of damage in that fight, but I guess they managed to repair it because it looked great here. And even though Shreddit was on the run that it was, Kenny's key kept on underrating it, and quite frankly, so did I, mainly because when both these robots were doing their Twitch test, I could not help but notice that Shreddit was moving kind of wonky and started off its fight off-center in its square. Made me think that, you know, maybe that the drive issues had caught up to Shredder Bro at this point. But I guess it turns out I was trying to put on the robot combat analyst hat way too hard. I was reading way too between the fucking lines because Shredded did what Shredded has done the entire goddamn episode. Evan Arias made this whole battle look like an NHRL 2021 stream with the nonstop aggression and damage to the much more experienced Valkyrie. My boys from New York City were an absolute bulldog here, but it didn't seem that way at first. After three solid drum strikes, the weapon on Shredder Bro was dead, seemingly leaving it as a perfect target for Valkyrie. But Shredder had quite the secret weapon for this fight. Raw pushing power. 
I did not know Shredded had this kind of oomph in such a small package. Even with Valkyrie's weapon at full bore, it just continued to be an ox inside the battle box for the fight's remainder. Shoving its busted drum again, again, and again into the weapon and face of Valkyrie. Managing to push the MIT undercutter all over the battle box. And you know what? Shit, boys. It worked. Halfway into the fight, Valkyrie became a robot with all weapon and no drive. And more often than not, the robot with all drive and no weapon ends up winning these kinds of exchanges and showdowns. Evan Arias put on a driving masterclass in the final minute, taking Valkyrie all over the arena, ramming it into each and every hazard until Shredder Bro managed to win its third straight KO over a robot which has been to the top 32 before. A victory in 2 minutes and 29 seconds, which meant that the 8th seed, the bottom of the barrel, my last pick to win this tournament, was safe. And into the Tournament of Freaking Champions, the very last episode of the year. And this was insane. I genuinely could not be happier for Evan Arias, and especially for my friends here at the Combat Collective, Alex Peza and Angel Vidal. Even you, Lake Stengel, I don't know if you were at this uh, taping. I didn't see you at all during the episode, but shout outs to you as well. For months since the BattleBot season ended, one of the go-to robots everyone had not returning for 2024 was, of course, Shredded Bro. We have seen this team be mediocre to sometimes downright awful inside the 250-pound arena for three straight years. But as we saw with Deadlift in 2020, sometimes all it takes is one magical run and one of these super tournaments to lock your spot into the next season. And the bad boys from New York City did just that. Shredded Bro looked incredibly weird pictured next to robots such as Saw Blaze, Endgame, and Tantrum. But damn it, they deserve it after that phenomenal run. Congratulations to the team, and we will see you guys again in November. I am so excited for uh, Team Shredded. Super excited for Robots Ruin My Life. Maybe we can get some uh, sales done happening over there, RRML. Some, uh, some more, you know intrigue people trying to buy shredded bro merchandise you all should buy some shredded bro merchandise this the season to get it and of course i do want to say this real quick i meant to have a whole segment to it but i forgot to do it i wrote them here at the very end i want to give a shout out to our award winners at BattleBots this year rory mangles and monsoon won the sportsmanship award great month for rory mangles we got to see the return of nuts we got to see him win the sportsmanship award that was super sweet Huge one, most destructive, a little bit of a surprise given Riptide was there. And as much as I hate to say it, Riptide was a very destructive robot all year, but I guess they didn't want to award bad behavior. I don't blame them for that one. Ripperoni, shocking to me, I jumped up for this one. One best designed, certainly thought that was going to be Quantum's award, but Ripperoni, certainly a well-designed robot, and they certainly deserved it. And the big one here, Founders Award. Chris Rose presented it himself, and what a no better person to give this to. Mad Catter and Martin Mason, the personality of robot combat, one of the most electric people in the sport, whether it be at Robot Games or BattleBots, took home the giant bolt, the Founders Award, some hardware to Bad Kitty. I certainly love to see it. One thing worth noting here, though, no Rookie of the Year? <laughs> Why didn't we have a Rookie of the Year? We had fantastic rookies. We didn't have a pulverizer to present to any of them, I guess. But we had great robots, great new robots this year. And really, we should have saw Ripperoni win a second award here. I don't know exactly what was going on there, but I digress. They still won Best Design, so at least they got to leave with a little bit of hardware. Omega Team taking home some big prizes makes me super happy. But that's all we got to talk about here on Robot Combat tonight. This was a loaded potatoes kind of episode. We discuss robots live. We discuss Battle of Robots. We discussed Extreme Robots. We discussed BattleBots Champions. BattleBots Champions finally returning. So I would say eight fights up, eight fights down. I should say seven fights up, seven fights down. My bad. But really, dozens upon dozens of robots up. Dozens upon dozens of robots down. Congratulations to... Iron All 8 for winning Robots Live. Congratulations to Shred It Bro and all the BattleBots Award winners on Champions. Congratulations to all the qualifiers of Battle of Robots. And congratulations to Team Inferno for taking the lead at Extreme Robots. And I guess shout outs to Mega Mouse as well. They were Extreme Robots champion for all of like, what, five hours? That was a little bit of a fun story. 
but there's more exciting stuff to come. Next week, I already talked about it. We are doing a big time proving grounds catch up. Hopefully, I can get Mantine in the house for that. We are going to be talking about a month and change of proving grounds fights, and there are a lot to talk about here. Some very promising robots in that bundle. I'm so excited to talk about Conquering Clown. And then the week after that, Norwalk Havoc. Week after that, more heavyweight updates. We got a lot to talk about here to go alongside Battle Boss Champions. We're going to be doing more event breakdown videos. Those are going to be coming down the line if I can find some time to write them. These RCT episodes are always such a massive script. This was an 11-page script. This was insane. I usually don't write scripts this long, but this one came out kind of beefy. I got to try to do something about that in the future. But I digress. I'm your host, as always, Sterling Brown, a.k.a. Sterling TXTG on Instagram. You can find me there. Um, please be sure to join the giveaway that we have on Robots Ruin My Life, our partnered giveaway. That's going to be linked in the description below. Be sure to check out Robots Ruin My Life as well. Of course, our sponsors, our dear friends over there, great people. Love Tony D'Ambrosio. It's a shame what happened to Darkstar. And, of course, our social media as well as we start wrapping it up here. You can find the Combot Collective on Instagram. You can find them on Facebook. We make infographics there. We post our TCC 10 there. We post all sorts of fun stuff there. You can join our Discord server. If you want video updates before anywhere else, <clears throat> sometimes we record Robot Combat tonight there. I was trying to do it there this time around, but time just kind of crunched up on me. It's been a very busy weekend. That's where we usually record them live. We usually have a little bit of a live audience. We do some live interaction, answering questions and what have you. And of course, you're here on the dis And of course, you're here on the YouTube page, the mothership right here. If you like this Robot Combat Tonight episode, please like the video, leave a comment giving us your thoughts on these four heavyweight events and maybe even a little bit of constructive criticism. We want to make TCC as good as we can on the road to 700 subscribers. And uh, please, y'all, speaking of subscribing, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell icon, because we got a lot of Robot Combat tonight and heavyweight event breakdowns to discuss with you guys over the next few weeks, next month or two. It's going to be a fun holiday season. It's going to be a busy holiday season for me, but that's going to wrap it up for us. Congratulations to Shredder Bro joining the Golden Bolt Tournament. We'll discuss next week's, well, next week on Robot Combat tonight. It's a stacked episode. Looks like a top eight bracket for a major tournament. Seven monsters, seven top 32 level killers, and hijinks is there as well, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel so bad for hijinks. This has been Robot Combat tonight, though. Happy Halloween, y'all. Let's go, Rangers. Let's go, Shredder Bro. Let's go, Team 57. All that good jazz. We will see you next time for our 16th episode of Robot Combat tonight. Y'all be safe. This was the Combat Collective. I'm the hardest hard ram and this color.